Hello everyone. Welcome to Higher Study Prep Students Live session. We have a couple of viewers already, but we'll wait a little more. While we are waiting for our audiences to join, let me briefly introduce Higher Study Prep. HSP or Higher Study Prep is a complete guideline in your higher study journey, especially if you're targeting a US university. If you have any questions or need help about anything about higher study, go check our website, which is higherstudyprep.com. You can see it at the below of the screen, higherstudyprep.com. Or you can go to our Facebook group and our YouTube channel. We have hundreds of blogs, videos, and tutorials on our website, on our group, and, and our YouTube channel. We even have a discussion tab on our website. So you can go there, start a discussion. We'll try to participate in that discussion tab, and you can help get help from us as well as you can get help from your fellow students. If you need help with your SOP resume, go check our document review service. We have a pool of reviewers who have already gone through the process and have the experience of working with professors. They really have a clear idea of what makes an SOP stand out of the crowd. Go to highstepprep.com and find out the package that suits you. If you're preparing for GRE, go check out GRE course and GRE practice and mock test module. We have more than 600 highly standard GRE questions. Two mock tests with the same interface of the GRE. The great benefit of our mock test is the interface is exactly the same as the original ETS GRE exam. It will take the test under the same time constant and on the same interface. So you'll get the real experience of GRE before sitting for the real GRE. Okay, let's get back to the session. So we already have a couple of viewers I can see. So in these sessions, we are honored to have Dr. Shuman Choudhury, Assistant Professor in the Department of Industrial Manufacturing and Systems Engineering at Texas Tech University. So before we start, I would like you to share this link to your friends whom you think might get benefit from today's session. So let's welcome Dr. Shuman Choudhury. Hi, <clears throat> thank you, Tarek, uh, for inviting, inviting me in this session. And um, I would also like to say hi to all the attendees. Um, as uh, Tarek mentioned, my name is uh, Dr. Suman Chaudhuri. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Industrial and Manufacturing and Systems Engineering and, and the director of um, Human Performance and Neuroengineering Lab. Um, and my research is in the areas of uh, human factors engineering and uh, biomechanics. So, um, uh, Tarek sent me uh, a few questions, and uh, also I would like to start with uh, like a little bit background about uh, how the admission committee form and how the department evaluate a candidate. So, um, it's so it's it's a more more or less kind of uh, same across all the universities in the North America, like uh, including United States. Um, uh, so, so there are like uh, every department has some concentration. Concentration means like some subject, uh, some particular area of research. Usually, like the the there are like a two steps in graduate application review process. One is the subject wise review, another one is the uh, graduate committee. The way they evaluate the candidate. So, let's say uh, in my area is in biomechanics area. So if there are like a 50 applicants in this area, even though I'm in the graduate committee, admission committee, but uh, I will make some recommendation and I'm then my recommendation will go to the graduate uh, admission committee. So graduate admission committee, I just wanna make sure that uh, our recommendation or an applicant meet the minimum requirement of, a, of any university or a, a general requirement. But there are some subject-wise requirement that uh, applicant must need to meet. So, um, so that's how the application is reviewed. And uh, yeah, I mean, 
I guess, uh, Tarek, we are ready to go into the uh, questions. So uh, when I actually uh, talk about the, each individual question, uh -huh. we can actually enlighten them more about how, how the, uh, the graduate committee evaluate an applicant. Thank you, Dr. Chaudhuri. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we all know that it's not an easy job to get into a good grad university in the US or anywhere in the world. It's, it's not an easy task, especially if you are looking for some sorts of funding or scholarship. So many students apply to multiple universities, send hundreds of emails to professor and never get a response back. That's a common frustration among students. I, I have gone through the same situations by myself and I can, I can really relate to that pain by myself. So one of the mistakes of mine was I didn't really invest time to understand what a professor really look for in a students. I didn't try to understand them. I thought that I have a good GPA, I have a good GID score, and that should be enough. But that's not necessarily always true. Apparently, there are thousands of students who have better GPA and better GID score than me. So in today's session, so we'll try to understand the selection process from the perspective of a professor. What does a professor really want from a students? Is it all about the GID? or GPA, or there are, some, there are some other factors. Before going to the main sections of today's sessions, let me briefly talk about what are the topics that we are going to cover today. So first of all, we'll talk about what does a professor look for in a prospective students? That's very important thing. And again, we'll talk about some of the very core factors in the application package, uh, which is our Topic number two, that what does a professor look for in a statement of purpose? What does a professor look for in a resume or in an email? Or what about the subject matter choice? So those are really very important, uh, crucial factors when you're applying for a grad, grad school or any type of higher study. So stay tuned with us. We hope that these sessions will be helpful for you guys if you're if you are preparing for applying for higher study or thinking to go for higher study in your future. So I would like to request to you that if you know someone who are preparing for our study or will get benefit from these sessions, please share these sessions with, with them. We really appreciate that. I want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the first question that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we can go through the individual question again. Um, before that, I want to just talk a little bit about uh, like, um, yeah, so as I mentioned, like uh, there are like a fourth different, uh, three different things. One is that uh, teaching assistantship, mm -hmm. research assistantship, mm -hmm. and the third is that you don't need any funding. Mm -hmm. you, have, you, 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 you are a very rich kid. Like uh, your dad has a lot of money. You don't, you don't care about uh, you know professors' money, and um, and uh, you have a lot of money to study for your ma masters or PhD. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so there are like a two different admission criteria, right? One is for the master's student and another one is for the PhD student. So today's session, when I, I speak up, I will answer any question more uh, more applicable for the PhD applicants. Mm -hmm. so because uh, if I am not wrong, a majority of the R1 means highest research universities in the United States, they usually do not uh, give any uh, master's level funding they usually prefer to give funding to a PhD level students. Okay. So, so this is something, uh, you know, that I want your audience to keep it in mind. My mm -hmm. answer is for PhD applicants, people, uh, the students who want to pursue a PhD degree, specific, uh, especially at, uh, at the uh, United States. Okay. So Canada or European countries, they might have a different standard to evaluate a candidate. Right. And, uh, and another thing is that, um, so we are human being, right? Mm -hmm. I have my own judgment. And mm -hmm. one of my colleagues might have a different judgment, but exactly. definitely we have uh, common ground. I, I'm talking about that. My evaluation criteria is 95% uh, overlap with my colleague. There could be 5% different than, 5% of those evaluation criteria could be different. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's not a one person job. It's a committee member job, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, like I mentioned, there is a subject-wise committee member. So they are not the committee member. It's basically we want to hear their voice about a candidate. 
Then there is another is uh, uh, overall graduate admission. So basically, we want to make sure that uh, every applicant was evaluated um, equally. So there is no bias remain. Let's say uh, we do not want to see a faculty to recruit somebody who doesn't have any GRE or doesn't have uh, even a good GPA. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say below three out of four. So then we're going to raise some of the question that why did you select this candidate? You need to rationalize it. So then you need to write down some kind of a special note that, yes, this is the reason I think he could fit to my research um, area, or this is the reason actually he can be beneficial to the department. So those are the things um, we look at it. So as I go back to the, my previous conversation about the teaching assistantship, research assistantship, and no funding. So teaching assistantship is mainly evaluated by the graduate committee overall, and the research assistantship uh, is more of an individual evalu evaluation. Yeah. So let's uh, go to the specific questions. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary. Yeah, mm -hmm. we all know this is not is the. Uh, the decision is not the one person's decision. There is the admission committee, right? So there are a couple of people on the admission committee who collectively take the decisions. So whatever we are saying, that's, that's our our personal view. But what will, those will match most of the time, but there might be some differences. And especially we will talk about uh, interest sessions. We especially focus on the uh, admission in the U.S. In universities that might not be applicable to some other universities like Canada or the Europe. Of course, there are some overlapping areas which are common to every university, but this session is particularly for U.S. universities. So our first question is, as we, we all know that Dr. Choudhury, you are in the graduate admission committee of your department. Right. So can you share your experience as a member of the admission committee? What particular space, what particular qualities you look for right. when you were reviewing the, the applicant package of a student? Yeah. Can you share your sure. experience? Right. So uh, basically, when the application package is sent to the department from the graduate and uh, graduate office, we have everything like the whole package so any incomplete application is not sent to the department that means we will have your transcript all transcripts gre toefl everything if there is, if there is not an any special request made the graduate uh, admission or the graduate office won't uh, forward any application package to the department so uh, there is one uh, so that way actually we evaluate we have an evaluation sheet and the, and the whole package. So for individual sub uh, student, we have one folder, which has almost every documentation, recommendation letter and everything. So what do we look for? We look at everything. We look at, uh, it's not uh, only GPA or GRE, or we look at every pages. In Let's say in transcript, I want to see uh, um, like how good you are in mathematics. Right, so because mathematics is uh, is one of the foundation of a good PhD research, I want to look at your um, your uh, analytical skill as well. What kind of a skill set you have? So we look at almost everything. We just go by page by page. Then, then we made a recommendation. First recommendation would be that: Do you, uh, am I interested to advise this student? So is that if an application, I said no, means it is rejected. If I say yes, means he will definitely get an admission. Then the second question is that, do I want to fund this student? Uh, do I want to provide any scholarship money to this student? Yes or no? So if I, prov if I say yes, that means I have to, from my own research funding or from the department, I can recommendation like this student, is from a very good university and he has a very good GPA. He has a very good GRE score. I recommend this student for graduate admission. I recommend this student for a graduate teaching assistantship. So we usually make those kind of recommendations. And uh, for research assistantship, as I mentioned, it's an individual decision. But for a um, for a teaching assistantship, it's it's a uh, 
uh, it's a collective decision. So, uh, and again, the evaluation process is almost same. So what is more important for a teaching assistantship? Mainly the subject matter uh, uh, expertise, not ex expertise, subject matter familiarity. Let's say in the, uh, a student wants to get a teaching assistantship, right? So I want to see that uh, which particular class he can serve as a teaching assistant. So in that case, if uh, his or her uh, degree program is in industrial engineering or mechanical engineering, then I might, uh, you know, the graduate committee will may more lean toward uh, that particular applicant. So, uh, but, but for a research assistantship, uh, it's a different game. It's an individual evaluation. They look at what kind of relevant skill set they have and what kind of, uh, uh, project that that the person worked in the past what kind of skill set they have in the past and it's and also like they always keep it one thing in mind that we are not hiring an employee we want to you know we want a phd student so you want to see that the the person the student is capable to uh, excel in his phd program so that means they need to have a good GRE score, they need to have a good GPA, and um, um, and they need to have a good, uh, a very clean, nice, and concise uh, long-term goal. So uh, for that reason, there are three things uh, are very important. The first one is that GRE. GRE is the icebreaker. We, I personally don't don't care what is your GPA. Uh, but SOP, Statement of Purpose, and the GRE will tell everything. Okay, now let me tell you what is that means. The way I have seen like my colleague to evaluate an applicant is that GPA means your work ethics. You have been hardworking and you have been consistent. You have a good work ethics because in PhD, uh, uh, like a 50% of the PhD is a hard working consistency. That means in GPA, you showed that. But PhD, it, not only the hard working, you need, to have, you need to be very smart, right? So GRE shows your smartness, how smart you are, right? So your quantitative score, qualitative score, uh, no, sorry, verbal score is very important. But one can argue that uh, probably like in certain countries, GRE's, GRE's, getting a GRE score is easier. Probably like they have a little bit different standard or somebody uh, made a multiple attempt, right? So I personally look at the analytical score, which is the writing score. So writing score will, will tell us exactly how good that person is. Because uh, in, in PhD, ultimately you have to be a very good writer. Your almost two years, you you will work on uh, writing your PhD research. Uh, you you need to work on writing journal conference papers, right? So I personally lo look at like a GRE quantitative. So if somebody has below three, I wouldn't consider that part particular applicant for my own research team. Uh, so I believe that majority of the uh, faculties in the United States they look at that way. And second is the uh, quantitative score. So in every university has uh, a, a threshold for quantitative score. Let's say uh, Texas Tech University is one of the is a, is a R1 university, highest research university, and we have a very good engineering program. And we usually uh, we can give admission to a student ha having GRE score of 161 or 62 if they have a good GPA, uh, but we will not we usually don't fund that a student. If, uh, there is some exception, exceptional case. Uh, we should not talk about it. We, uh, we are here try to talk about the generic or general uh, consideration. So uh, we need, you know, the prospective students need to make sure that they have a very good GRE score. And GPA, in my opinion, if you have a above three, it's fine. Uh, because uh, let me put it this way. Like there are like a thousands of university across the globe, right? And uh, we have no idea. Let's say there is a country called Nigeria, 
we do not know how good universities were there, how they evaluate their candidate, right? So uh, some university is getting a GPA is uh, easier than other universities, right? So, but one thing is the global standard, that is the GRE. So that's the reason we want to see their GRE score. And that's the icebreaker. GRE, again, GRE reflect how smart applicant is. GPA reflect, in my opinion, it's a just work ethics last last four years, how consistent uh, applicant was and um, and how hardworking. So, so th this combination is very important. As I mentioned, PhD, writing, hardworking, and smartness means academic smartness. I'm not, it's not a straight smartness. So GRE will reflect the smartness of a candidate. So these three, and again, it's an overall package. Uh, I want to mention one thing to the all the applicant is that be yourself. Don't fake your, you know, your uh, co uh, qualifications. This is the mistake. I would say, especially in Bangladesh, almost 70% um, candidates do that. Let's say I can talk about one of my subject matter is that we look at your trans, uh, transcript, we look at your GRE score, your GPA, almost everything. It's uh, like if you fake somewhere, we can catch it. That's in SOP. Uh, when you read an SOP means like uh, we, we are basically sc uh, scanning your brain, your mind. So if you fake somewhere, if you say we did that, that, we can catch it. And uh, remember the faculties they review hundreds of applicants every year. So yeah. Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary. That was really eye-opening. I wish I knew them when I was applying. So you, you mentioned really three really important things and the the differences or the importances between between the factors that you consider when you are selecting a student. Like some of us or many of us, we think that probably GPA is no. the main factor. No, it, it no. said that GRE from, yeah. from your personal yeah. perspective. I, I say, many senior faculties, GPA, let, just think about it. Like uh, even if I say in, in Bangladesh, we have received some applications from uh, some universities I don't want to mention. Mm -hmm. um like, let's say their students GRE uh, GPA is 3.92 and the class ranking is uh is uh, below 50 percent and uh, but the GRE quantitative is 152 right mm -hmm. on the other hand there's another engineering university the student has a G GPA 3.02 but mm -hmm. GRE is 168 so and he's uh, in even 3.02 the class ranking is about like 60 percent so uh, so we look at all those criteria we exactly know uh like uh, so that's the reason actually we do not uh consider gpa is the first criteria mm -hmm. again when in, in here in us news ranking for ranking our graduate admission we had we need to report the gre score so gre is the most important thing mm -hmm. There are many other, you know, hidden criteria we use that mm -hmm. I cannot speak of about all of them. And the students do not need to know all yeah. of them. Yeah. Well, uh, here I'm talking about something that they can modify, they can change, you know, they can change in their personal life to improve them some, some be themselves better. So, mm -hmm. so that's why I feel like that GRE is the most important criteria uh, and um, I, I personally do not recommend any G, any GRE quantitative score below 160. Mm -hmm. I feel like that the student is not uh, is not, and also like if somebody has analytical score lesser than three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. analytical means the writing score. Mm -hmm. yeah. Writing is good. Thanks for sharing that. I di I didn't really understand that that the analytical the writing skill is that much important. So it looks like it's 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 really yeah. important if yeah. you're doing PhD. Yeah. Yeah. I have seen in AM Texas when I was at Texas AM, I talked to the my colleague. One thing they mentioned in that probably across the globe there could be some universe, some countries, um, you know, a uh, student might get access to many question base. You know, they have a and sometimes you know you you cannot uh, uh, you cannot uh, I would say 
you cannot manipulate the writing. Mm -hmm. You can manipulate right. verbal. You can manipulate quantitative. I do not. I want mm -hmm. to be politically correct here. Yeah, I that's that's really mind. inherent. But analytical score will tell exactly like a writing. The way I say by student is that writing will tell your background, your uh, who you are. You know, like when you you write something, basically that is you are expressing your mind and and how much you know about the subject matter how much how good you are in english so these are very important so let's mm -hmm. so, so that is the reason i i personally do not hire any of my students mm -hmm. having an analytical score uh, lesser than 3.5 mm -hmm. that put it this way <laughs> yeah thank you dr choudhury mm -hmm. so I, I will tell the students go start start writing practice writing that's that's really important if you're if you're if you want to go for phd application so as dr chudhuri mentioned that at least try to get above 3 if you fall below 3 then probably your application will not be considered so make a habit of writing every day write something read good articles and learn from those good articles and by applying what you have learned reading all those good articles uh, good articles one uh, important thing about developing a writing skill is you have to write by yourself don't just read practice writing so that will develop your writing skill so thank you dr choudhury our next question is we all know that and also you mentioned that statement of purpose that is another very important document in the application package as you said that the decision doesn't depend on single thing it's kind of a package so your overall package have to be good enough to catch attractions from the uh, from the professors right so and one of the most important is the statement of purpose so my next question to dr choudhury is when you are reviewing a statement purpose of a student what are the criteria what, what are the things you want to see in that statement of purpose of a student okay can you tell right oh, definitely so i have recently uh, you know hired one student uh, as, as a research assistant only thing made him different than the other candidates are uh, is the statement of purpose so i had a top three candidate candidate i need to choose one so it was very difficult to choose out of those three top three so one thing made the difference is the statement of purpose so first of all do not write any irrelevant things mm -hmm. we know where as i mentioned do not try to you know blabber or do not try to fake yourself so this is the mistake um uh, like a graduate students do and that thing that we are dumb we are not dumb <laughs> the professor a lot of students i mean i i'm jokingly saying that that thing we are dumb no we are not dumb <laughs> <laughs> we give you hundreds of a statement of purpose we exactly know where you are copying something from some somewhere else yeah <laughs> copying doesn't mean the doesn't mean mean only sentence the ideas let's say galen you said this thing that motivate me why you need to say that how is it relevant to your your application package be straightforward just it's a two page document you have so many things to mention like one of the candidates that i i really liked in in one of the statement of purpose even though i could not hire uh, that candidate is that she's from the bangladesh university of engineering and technology and Sudden, she was very good at first year and second year, and third year her GPA is really bad. Fourth year she could mm -hmm. not recover it. So, in the statement of purpose, she uh, talked about it. Why it happened? She lost her father. She had an accident, and so she lost the track. So things might happen. You know, it, things happen in everybody's life. So she used statement of purpose as a media to convey herself. So use the statement of purpose to page convey your own message. Mm -hmm. So uh, specifically, what I look at it, the three things: um, what is your research interest? What is your long-term goal? And what kind of relevant skills you have? These are mm -hmm. the three things I look at from the candidate. And fourth thing, I want to see how can I help this candidate to achieve that uh, long-term goal. So. Like uh, I'm telling a story that I, I'm writing a statement of purpose to a particular department, right? 
there i will talk about my background a little bit and this background so it's a transition and why i want to pursue phd in this university because i have a long term goal uh -huh. and how the department or an individual faculty that he wants to work on it can help me to achieve that goal that's it nothing more than that you know like a, let's now if you have a, some nice work if you want to uh, have a, some nice project talk about it that is part of your background and your skill set so how he can he or she can contribute to the department or individual research group what he or she can gain to achieve the long term goal that's it so mm -hmm. and uh, um there is a um and uh, another thing i would like to mention that uh, in a statement of purpose it has to be specific mm -hmm. let's say electrical engineering there are different directions right so you cannot be generic electrical engineering it has to be a specific uh area so what we do like in industrial engineering there is a one biomechanics area there is a one is operation research uh, third is manufacturing so if a student do not reflect any specific area of interest then we usually put that student into uh, another category on un, uh, unidentified uh, subject mm -hmm. right so in that case all the committee member need to go through that candidate so that means right now you are evaluating evaluated by five person and whereas if you do not specify your area of research or inter your interest you will go by total 20 faculty evaluations that means your chance of getting admission getting funding will be lower this one divided by 20 versus one divided by five right so yeah. that will be very specific. Now, I will talk about the resume later. But uh, again, specific is a, it should be a nice story. Mm -hmm. What is your background? What is your long term goal? And the, how the department or an individual faculty's research can help the applicant to achieve that goal. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Choudhury. Yeah, one very important thing you mentioned that in, in your statement of purpose, do not try to write something which is not true because the professors they are not dumb people there and they are reviewing a statement of purpose hundreds of a statement of purpose so if you write something which is not true which is false it is almost certain that you will get caught and also another very important thing dr choudhury mentioned is be specific and try to mention what is your research goal that's important because Professor wants to know that what, in which field you were really interested. Does it match with his or her background? Right. I can I can relate to my my story when I was first writing my statement of purpose when I was applying back in 2013. I had a couple of years of experience in the industry, so I wrote a lot of things about my work experience. I wrote I did this. I did this extraordinary project in my in my office in 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 telecom industry but what i didn't understand it doesn't really matter to the professor because he's not working in that field he's doing research in another field so i need to tell something i need to tell some convincing story which is related to that that professor's related research field or which field i'm interested in so that is also very important i didn't knew that at that time i wish i knew that that time so one, one thing I uh, want to mention that if you think that this session is useful, uh, please share it with your friends, with your timeline. Uh, if you think that this session will be helpful for your friends. So please go ahead and do that. We really appreciate that. And we have a, a document review service in higherstudyprep.com. So if you are struggling in, uh, with your, when you are writing your statement of purpose, your resume or email, you need help from some experienced people. Uh, please go to higherstudyprep.com. We have a document review service over there and a, a pool of reviewers, very experienced reviewers who can help you to yeah. get your statement of purpose, get out, yeah. of, out of the crowd. Yeah, Parekh, I, I just want to uh, make a silly comment after mm -hmm. 
those are the most important thing and uh, make sure that you review your statement of purpose with your with your friends um so because some and and um i have we have we received a lot of applications they apply in different universities they mm -hmm. always mess up with the university name program <laughs> name so <laughs> yeah, it's true. Point to that. yeah yeah it's true be very careful when you are sending your statement of purpose your resume don't mess up when you are sending to texas tech university yeah. you don't mention that you are sending to some other university right so mm -hmm. it, will, it will mess up your applications yeah it will just how good your gpa or gre again uh, every faculty read statement of purpose mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got a couple of questions in uh, comment sections. So we'll try to answer them. One of the questions I got, let me quickly take these questions. So Mr. Ahmed Khan said, according to my university, my CGPA is 3.05, but my average mark is around 87%. So his question is, is CGPA score is reviewed or average marks? I mean, um, just think about in terms of this way. Like, if you have a GPA 3.05, and uh, if you have a quantitative score in GRE is 168, versus a candidate having GRE 3.87, but quantitative score is 160, you will be preferred than him or her. Mm -hmm. So again, you already met the admission criteria, three above. Even uh, I personally, look at even if an applicant has a 2.87 we, we we have seen many um applicants having gpa below three but it still got uh, full funding mm -hmm. and so wh wh what is this the icebreaker it's a total application package and the gre even if even if they do not have a good gre let's say a quantitative score of 165 when I see that, uh, that he has, he or she has a good writing skill, and he or she uh, wrote an excellent uh, SOP, excellent email to me, I'm convinced. So basically, it's, it's an impression of a person who you are. Like, and uh, so there are some other things that we I will talk after these four questions. But again, it's the whole package. But in whole package, uh, you know, if you let's say uh, this is the whole circle. Or well, big circle is GRE. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Choudhury. I, I hope you got your answer, Mr. Ahmed Khan. So our next next topic is resume. Probably the next important document that you need to send to the admission committee is your resume. So I would like to ask Mr. Choudhury about, about the resume. When you're reviewing a resume, what do you expect to see in that resume? Can you tell a little bit about that? Okay, let me think about it. Yeah, um, your resume and your SOP, uh, your resume and your SOP is basically they complement each other, right? Mm -hmm. So, in your SOP, you don't, you cannot mention all the skills that you have. Mm -hmm. But in your resume, you want to see what kind of skill set, a nice breakdown of your skills. We are not looking for an expert. Again, do not show that you are expert on that particular area. You know, modesty is very important uh -huh. in the overall package. And modesty is the most important thing. In Like, uh, I, uh, I will talk about it. We all, Right now, almost uh, majority of the universities, they conduct an interview as well. Just even though if you have all of this, still you want to see you as a person, you know. So modesty is very important. And um, in the skill set, um, how they are related to your SOP, research interest has to be very specific. You cannot have everything together. Let's say in, in, a, in electrical engineering, you cannot say that your research interest is power, electronics, and uh, then um, uh, like a different areas. You cannot say that. You have to target a particular area. In our, our field, I want to see uh, a, if an applicant wants to work with me or in my field, I want to see the research interest is only in this area. Or a, 
very close related research interest. It cannot be significantly different. So you, whenever you su submit any application, make sure that your research interest is reflecting your SOP. Skill set reflecting your SOP. You can put every skill set you have, even if you want to say that I have the power. So right now, and your, your interest is something else, computational modeling. So what I'm going to do with your power experience? Nothing, right? So resume two page. Any unnecessary information, just delete them. Do not distract us. You know, we don't have time. If I tell you how, far, how much time I spend in applicant, maximum two to three minutes, even the whole package, we just scan through it. We look at that transcript very well. And transcript, we just scan through it. Like how good you are in mathematics classes, how good you are in the particular subject uh, area that you are interested. We look at what you got. So it's not a GP of 3.92. Let's say if I find a student have a, a vector geometry, have a C or B, we're going to wonder why he got that low GP uh, grades in that particular subject, right? Uh -huh. Again, going back to the resume, the skill, research interest, then uh, projects. Let's say you were working in industry. What are the relevant projects you have done? Project will will substitute or complement if you do not have any conference papers or journal articles. So if, if, you, if you have a journal articles or, or, or the papers, that's great. I mean, that means you have done some research. We will be impressed to hire you if you have a conference paper or journal articles. Uh, so, but if you do not have mentioned the project that you have worked, that means you have familiarity with my work um, and you have uh, you have done some very interesting project. The last is the most important thing is grammatical error. <laughs> Make sure that you do not commit any grammatical errors in your resume and your SOP as well. I, mm -hmm. I forgot to mention that one. Um, your grammatical errors, especially if you if if there is an uh, uh, like a American professor like uh, I would say like uh, domestic professors, they will scrap that applicant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary. Yeah, your grammatical mistake will not be forgiven, especially when you have some automated tools to make the corrections for you. So there is no reason not to use those tools. So if you yeah. don't use them, it 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 will be it will be just thrown away. Don't make any grammatical mistakes on your SOP on your resume. There are a couple of good, very really good automatic tools like I can mention Grammarly. So take advantage of that. Do not make any grammatical mistakes. So one one more thing, Dr. Chaudhary mentioned is be specific in your resume. So probably professor will not spend too much time to go through your resume, maybe 20 seconds, 30 seconds. So you got only 20, 30 seconds of time to tell what you are really good at. So do not waste that time writing some garbage things in your resume. Try to write what you are really good at. Like I have seen some of the resume, like they say that they're good at everything, including Microsoft Word. That doesn't really matter. It, it is expected that you have to be good at Microsoft Word. So you don't really need to mention that in your resume. Write down if you're good at MATLAB, right? Some other software that, that is going to be required in the research field, but Microsoft Word or Excel, that doesn't really make sense. So try to write down only those things that you're really good at and really relevant to the research field that you are going to apply for, right? So the next question is, it probably kind of might get into personal level too. So I, I got many queries about many students complain that they have sent hundreds of emails to, to the professors and they never really heard back from the professors and they got really frustrated. Uh, I know professors, they they receive hundreds of emails every day. They don't really have time to go through each and every email. So, so probably the most important part of your email is the subject line you write on the on the email. So I'd like to ask Mr. Chosuri. So when you have when you receive hundreds of email, how do you decide which email you are going to open and which email from students you are going to respond? 
what are the criteria about those emails? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And um, yeah, I receive almost two, three emails every day about the at least prospective students. Make sure that you uh, use the prospective PhD student, mm -hmm. something like that. Use the prospective mm -hmm. so that it will help us and uh, you know help us to know you are a prospective student. Now, let me, and uh, what should be the emails, right? Um, let me put it this way. Um, especially it's for the masters or PhD students. So for any journal article or any conference paper, there's an abstract, right? Most of the journals have a word limitation of 250 words. So I usually, you know, I would like to recommend do not make it more than 200 words. And, um, and as a, and, and below the, that email, uh, below that email, I mean, your your main intention is um, is to get the attention of the professor, right? So I would suggest you to add your resume and uh, and the, and the statement of purpose to the professor. So and yeah, do not repeat the statement of purpose. You, you what you, you you want to say in an email is that. I am this, yeah, this is my background, one statement, right? I'm from that university and this is the subject I, I graduated from that particular program, one statement. Second statement, you can say that if you have some research skill that I, uh, oh, what motivated you to reach out to me or, or a professor? Put one or two sentences, maximum. Mm -hmm. Then tell the professor that I attach my resume my statement of purpose to work with you or in your university to this email. And these are my credentials, your GRE score, your GPA, and your, um, and, and if you want to add something like say, you have a two or three publications, like a three journal articles, two conference paper and what? If I, because I'm gonna read, scan them, the your body of the text, two to three seconds maximum, just like that. and and credentials. So if you have a good GRE score, that's 168, I can assure you that I will open that email. I will <laughs> look at your resume, I will look at your, uh, uh, your statement. If you have a GPA of 3.92, mm -hmm. I will definitely open that email, your, your resume, then I will spend some time with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, if a professor has uh, even if a, if a professor do not have any research money, still they will reply to you. They're gonna say, oh, oh, apply to our program uh, because uh, he can make an, a special request to the department to hire you as a teaching assistant. Mm -hmm. So if you think that you are not getting back from any professor, that means that is not professor fault, that is your fault. <laughs> you <laughs> Something is wrong with your package or your way of, writing it uh -huh. or your 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 the way you compose that email it's it's your fault mm -hmm. i would say one thing i would mention to the people in my whole career i would say i haven't i have never applied more than 15 for a okay. job in my whole career so i guess for my faculty position i have never applied more than eight or nine positions so mm -hmm. do not target 15 or 20 universities. You will mess up. You know, we have, everybody has our own mental capability that we can deal with. We have, mm -hmm. have our personal life. Target maximum seven or eight universities. Spend time on that. Research the for professor very well. What he does, does it match with your research area? Right. So let me give you an another example. It is uh, I can mention it to you. So all the department colleagues are we are very good friends. Mm -hmm. If there is an applicant from Bangladesh applying, knocking, knock a professor in my department, he or she will talk to me. Yeah. Someone, what do you think about this applicant? So I this happened like a three or four times. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And you can shoot an email to one faculty at operation research area within two minutes. So he's just texting me, do you know, uh, it's a good candidate. Can you please tell me something about this applicant? Within two minutes, I received a, uh, another you know, email. Then I said, <laughs> I also received an email from uh, that candidate. Then what happened? They said, okay, forget about it. <laughs> you know? That means this guy or this particular applicant, uh, he or she doesn't know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, it's very important. And we talk to each other. Like one applicant expressed an intense interest to work with me. On the other hand, when they applied in application package, I have seen it's a manufacturing area. So, and also like, uh, I also want to have this platform to convey to one of the things is that sometimes we request a special request from a professor probably local, can you please help this guy to get funding? But mm-hmm. when you go through that applicant, I have seen the application application has been already reviewed by okay. a, another area. Let's say we reviewed an applicant in manufacturing area. Now, if I request, if I receive a request to give that particular applicant uh, for a funding in my biomechanics area, I cannot do that because the application has been reviewed. The student mm-hmm. has already expressed the interest in manufacturing. So, so these are the thing you then need to keep it in mind. Always focus. Focus in a particular area. To do, just wait for next year. Mm-hmm. So, you know how many times a, a, a person apply for a job? More than twenty or thirty times, right? If it doesn't work out this area, wait for next year. But do not lose your hope. Be focused. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Dr. Choudhury. Yeah, honesty is is the key. So when you were writing an email. Do not lie on your email as well. It's, it's also really important, like your resume. So as Dr. Choudhury mentioned, the faculty members, they talk to each other. So in one moment, you were sending one email to one professor that you are the only professor in the world I want to work with. And in the next minute, you are sending another email to his colleague and saying that, no, you are the only professor I am to work with in the world. So it's really show that you are not really showing up your honesty about your research interest. And don't think that they don't know each other. They really talk to each other. So try to be honest in your email. That's that's yeah. really important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Tarek, you mentioned the one very good point about the honesty. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I will actually, I want to tell you something about it. Mm-hmm. So I'll give you another example. Um, let's say if there is an university uh, let's say I'm trying to hire, I already give an offer to a, a particular person mm-hmm. from a particular university in Bangladesh. Mm-hmm. And now he got the offer, accepted the offer. This is something people, especially from, from you know our countries, that do a lot. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, why honesty is very important. You as an individual, you might be benefited, but think about the collectively. Now, from a particular university, I got a, I actually offered some funding to a student. I'm just saying one person. Now the person is actually we are we do not only talk to my department colleague, we mm-hmm. talk to the faculties that we know across the university. Okay. So, what? Uh, let's see if a, if they do not show any honesty, mm-hmm. then we usually blacklist that particular department. We blacklist that university. Not only me. It's all of them, they will <laughs> never hire somebody from that university. Hmm. So that's why it's very important. Your honesty uh, is very important, not for you, but for your future uh, applicants as well. Yeah, that's really important. Don't don't get yourself into trouble. Don't get yourself blacklisted. That would be really bad for your applications. <laughs> so we got one really good question. Um, one of our user said a question is what type of subject line will catch a professor's attention among hundreds of emails from his students so what i believe is that the subject line is really important because before going to open up the mail you are going to read the subject line so if the subject line is not interesting probably you are not going to open up that email right so what what would be your answer so it's very straightforward you don't have to 
use that much brain, just say prospective student for fall 2021. So okay. Okay. Or pros or a prospective PhD student for fall okay. 2021. 2021 means 2021. That's mm -hmm. it. Okay, that's, that's, perspective that's really simple, simple, but I catch it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Your e email body is very important. As I mentioned, it should not be more than 200 words or 250 words. Try to make it a very concise. It, mm -hmm. So who you are, first statement. Uh, one or two statement about your background means what skills that you have or why you are interested to work with me or work with a professor. Then say that these are my the summary of my credentials are gi given below, and then put your GRE, your GPA, and your um, if you have any how many journal articles you have, or if you work within a very interesting project that match with uh, professor's profile, mention them. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure they will click on the uh, so attach the resume, attach the statement of purpose. Mm -hmm. Instead of writing like, um, you know, uh, 500 words of email, we do not even open them. We do not even click them. I just want to see what is the what is the credential. I do not have time. Again, right. we have many options. We, were not, we, we are not desperate for you. You should right. be desperate for us mm -hmm. to get a position. <laughs> so, so that's what I'm saying. I mean, we have hundreds of applicants in every year. Let's say at least 20 are shortlisted. So how we do how how they catch my attention? Very concise. Put the uh, credential. I will click on it. If I'm interested, I will reply to the candidate. Even what I do? Okay, I do not have funding for this particular session, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, particular semester. If I have an availability, I'll reach out to you. So I actually do reach out to a candidate after six or seven months later. It happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my, my, you know, I, I, I reach out to an applicant, okay, are you available now? Okay. I want to provide you funding. So, like. Mm, that's inspiring. <laughs> so, we'll take another question. Taki Hassan Rafi, he said, can conference publications help to compensate lower GPA? Again, GPA, if you have a GPA above three, don't worry about GPA at all. Just forget about it. Try to improve your current credentials in other way. Let's say mm -hmm. if you have a co relevant conference paper, uh, it should be a quality conference paper to convince the, it has to be a first author. Let's say if you have a conference paper, you are the fourth author mm -hmm. published in Bangladesh. I don't think any USA professor will bother about it. But if you have an international, international doesn't mean in Bangladesh, like uh, if you have a publication in USA somewhere, then it could be icebreaker. Okay. But again, do not worry too much about GPA. That's mm -hmm. the message I want to, you know, yeah. consider. Yeah, that's, that's one thing I, I learned from today's sessions that if you have a lower CGPA, don't get disheartened. Yeah. Dr. Uh, Dr. 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 GPA means work ethics. Mm -hmm. Theory means your smartness. Uh -huh. We look at a smart guy, or and work ethics means somebody is a hardworking, consistent. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. GPA could be important for teaching assistantship. Uh, but still, if you mess up with GRE, nobody will look at it. <laughs> GRE should be first criteria. So, then second criteria, if you have a low GPA, mention why. You have a low GPA. Let's say one of my, I can tell you one thing is that uh, one of my students that I hired, he mentioned that he did some kind of robotics project and and uh, and some kind of other activities in, in his, uh, uh, you know, in his uh, undergraduate, mm -hmm. right? So uh, he could not catch up with a GPA. Who got a better GPA? Who work harder in the class notes? Who actually take the class materials very seriously, right? Mm -hmm. if you, even if you could do that, you could have a better GPA. Right. So uh, a GPA is a wide range. Think about from three to three point uh, four, right? On the other hand, GRE bandwidth is very. Each if you lose one or two points, it's a mm -hmm. five to seven margin, right? Right. That will tell exactly who you know. That will make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's so if you have a low GPA, don't get disheartened. Try to yeah. improve your GRE score. Even if you have a low GPA of 2.75, mm -hmm. 
is still knock the faculty. Right. Even in the email body mentioned that actually, you know, my father died in two or three in the second or third years. I have a low GPA, but I have a very good GRE score. I, I work on this project. I have this skill set. And if you have any funding, and this is my long term goal, I want to work with you. Just mm -hmm. mention that. You know, it, it's a, you know, whatever you, you, you think about yourself, speak up your mind. That will convince the uh, faculty. Cool. So we'll take another questions. So one of our user viewer is saying, what if someone is interested in two departments in the same university? What would be a good way to approach and gather info? <laughs> that's, a, that's a very interesting question. And uh, um, two departments means, could you please ask him, like, is it a mechanical and industrial? or mechanical or computer science or mechanical and bio, biochemistry? What kind of department? Okay, so if you are listening, can you mention which departments are you interested in? I can I can say my example. When I was applying in back in 2013, I was interested in two departments. I was from electrical engineering. I was interested in electrical engineering as well as I was interested in into the computer science. So I applied for two departments at that time. Yeah, we got the answer from our user. He's saying architecture and civil, for example. Yeah, so for that particular applicant, again, uh, I, I understand now I can answer it. So I can talk a little bit about my area. So biomechanics is an interdisciplinary subject. So most of our colleagues are in, in mechanical engineering. Some are in electrical engineering working. Some are in biomedical engineering, right? So. Uh, there are a lot of interdisciplinary, uh, like a research topic. Uh, let's say if there is a landscape architecture. So you need to think about it. You know, what's, does your back, background match more with the landscape architecture? If it is yes, then look at a program. Uh, if a civil engineering, somebody is, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure in civil engineering, they don't do a landscape architecture. But let's say if, if there is an agricultural engineering, let's say they are doing a lot of landscape architecture work. You can consider that agricultural engineering as well as an architecture department. So you, you need to look at more specific area. In, if, 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 in a, um, if in the civil, somebody is working just for an example a landscape architecture then you can approach you can choose that even if i know somebody from the architecture department let's say in biomechanics i have two candidates the i i saw two candidates one he applied to mechanical engineering and biomechanics program he applied to industrial engineering and biomechanics program so and uh, so that means he's interested we don't, so that means we will definitely prefer him because he is interested to, to work in this area. Then I called my colleague in mechanical. Are you going to fund this student or please tell me? He said, yeah, Sumar, I want to fund this student. He reached out to me. I said, okay, go ahead. If he doesn't have any obligation, then I'm going to consider him. So when you apply, it has to be in a specific area. You cannot be like, you know, let's say if you want to, if you are, uh, interested. I'm not very familiar with architecture terms. Since the uh, questionnaire is from architecture, that's why I'm using this term. I could be wrong. Landscape architecture and building architecture, two mm -hmm. different area, right? And uh, and they do not match. So you can apply both of them as long as the faculties that do not talk to each other, you are fine. Mm -hmm. But there is a chance that they might, uh, you know, if you are a very good applicant, then if let's say if I go and 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 drink a coffee with somebody from architecture department, mm -hmm. and that's why I'm going to hire a student from Bangladesh, you know, mm -hmm. then oh really okay good yeah then I will talk and this is a student I'm going to hire. Mm -hmm. We talk about it, you know, we, we faculties we go for a happy hour. Happy hour means like a coffee, uh, mm -hmm. coffee adda. <laughs> yeah, like I'm taking some coffee right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> So when we talk to each other, when I, I, I found that an applicant reach out to like a, another colleague of mine who is not in my field, even though I, he, he applied, I was interested, I would still reserve to that candidate. 
Cool. I hope you I got your that is question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the next questions we are going to take, which is very much related to my background also. So is, is yeah. one user is asking, what if someone wants to switch track? Like I'm a telecom engineer and my job experience is in telecom. My background mm -hmm. is electronics and telecommunication engineering. Now I want to switch to electronics related subject. I have academic background on electronics, but continuing job in telecom for five years. Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, uh, the, the simple answer is mention it to the faculty. Faculty knows it, that you do not have background, show him interest, why, and given rationale, why you want to switch it. Mention one or two statements in the email, mention it more elaborately in the statement of purpose. <clears throat> thing uh, we haven't talked to the subject choice so my first student is from the electrical engineering background so we do a lot we actually work on human robot interaction right so i sent him for taking a class from the psychology department human factor psychology department his you know and then he came to me after two weeks he said that Prof professor i got stunned by the the students who were in that department they have electrical engineering background and uh, they have Somebody might have some other background. So, so this is something I would like, because it, it's related to the subject matter choice. Mm -hmm. So in Bangladesh, uh, I'm actually, it's for all of us, all, all over across the globe. But uh, since most of the participants in this session are from Bangladesh, that's why I man keep mentioning the you know, Bangladesh, origin of country. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah uh, so we talk we always think about in a modular way means oh i'm from electrical why i i, ca I can't go to the mechanical or mm. i can't go to the industrial i can't go to the no people do not think like that way in our biomechanics field like uh, my academic grandfather is dr mohammed ayu he his background is aeronautical engineering mm -hmm. and our mm. pioneers in this field majority of them are, are from electrical engineering background so similarly, like in this country, they do not think in that, you know, boxes. Mm, they, right. Everything is interdisciplinary. Just think about in your know, telecom uh, engineering. It right. is also kind of, it can be an inter interdisciplinary, not with me, but, you know, with the computer science or somehow, you know, they, so the most important thing is that what is skill set you have? What is your long-term goal? and how your current background can help you to get your long-term goal. Right. <clears throat> I can remember one example at this point. In the USA, people don't really care what's your background. They really care about what's your interest. So I can remember one example when I was studying in Texas a &M University in the computer science department. That time, uh, the head of the department was Dr. Nancy, Nancy Amata, and interestingly, her background was in economics. And now she's the head of the Department of Computer Science Department in Texas a &M University. So that's how people switch background from one subject to one subject. It doesn't really matter what's your interest, in, interest right. is. Like I am also a telecom engineer for six years. Then I changed my career from telecom engineering to software engineering. And now I'm a full-time software engineer. So you really have to prove that you are really interested you do really have interest in that subject. That's you need to prove in your statement of purpose in your resume. Right. 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 And another thing, I, I just want to take one more minute for, about that. So one of my colleagues, he is in operation research area. His undergraduate and master's was in, uh, were in uh, accounting. Now people can think about master's and bachelor's are in accounting, PhD in mathematics, got a position mm -hmm. Engineering, like a, as a professor in engineering, yeah, it happens a lot. I, right. Lot I know two of my uh, my seniors from uh, from Duet, Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technologies. Uh, their background is in civil engineering. They are currently a faculty in the finance department. <laughs> okay. So the next question is. Ahmed Khan again. Uh, thanks for enlightening us on the importance of GRE. But how much IELTS? can impact on our funding or admissions. Right. Yeah, IELTS or TOEFL are admission requirement. Uh, so 
I don't think, uh, yeah, if you have a good TOEFL score, it can help uh, in a, in a, in the, in the, to get a, a teaching assistantship position, but, uh, excuse me. So let's say if you, if like those criteria, we use it like kind of in the bottom line, in the bottom, like a, we have a, some mark, like number one is this, number two, one to 20, I would say also TOEFL is in, in 15 and below. Mm -hmm. Does that uh, answer his question? Yeah, Mr. Yeah, one to twenty criteria. Uh -huh. IELTS or TOEFL could be below fifteen. Okay, all right. So the next uh, question those are, is: uh, those are very important. If you do not have eighteen, then the graduate school won't let you get admit. They will give a conditional application uh, admission. Okay, so the next question is, I have seen some people admitted into PhD program, but obtained both MS and PhD upon completion. What are the trends in the US? Is there any MS leading to PhD admission plus funding or is it only PhD for funding? That's a great question. Uh, that's a really great question. And uh, I just want to mention one thing. For our university, we do not have policy to fund a master's student because we are the highest research university. I guess Texas A&M has the same policy. So, but if a individual person or if I have a research funding and if I really like a master's student after admission, I can hire him for one or two years. But um, this is something usually the department or university do not encourage. But but there are some universities they fund master's student. The reason is that they do not get quality PhD students. So that's the reason they usually, so you need to find out those universities. Let's say there is a state university at, let's just for an example, Illinois State University. I, you know, I don't know whether that kind of university exists, but there could be. Uh, <laughs> they probably do not get any, they do not have any PhD program but then it's a master's student as a teaching assistant for their undergraduate teaching. You can reach out to them, you might get some master's funding, but for the research universities, like a, like a Texas A&M, Texas Tech, or Ohio State or big universities, I don't think they provide funding to any master's student. Number two, uh, let me put it this way. If you want to do a PhD, do not wait waste your time doing master's. Doing Just master's. Like me, I have a master's, then I have a PhD. Do not waste your time doing the master's. Just go <laughs> for the PhD. Mm -hmm. Take five years for your PhD, but master's basically kind of uh, in that case, it, it could be a waste of time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Choudhury. So one of the last topic we want to discuss today is the subject matter choice. So can you shed some light on that matter? What about thoughts about subject matter choice? In subject matter choice, the you know there is a there is a there is a movie. I guess all of us are familiar with the three years, right? Three years, right? Rancho told Farhan, right? Yeah. Talk to your mind and choose something that because I guess it's a that is what you're gonna live for your rest of the life, right? So exactly. Make sure that you love that subject matter. And even if you get into that subject matter, start loving it. Uh -huh. If you do not start loving it, you will, your life will be horrible, terrible. If, see, there is, so we have this problem with in, in South Asia, we always kind of like rank everything. Like this is something, it's not your fault. It's our social system fault. Like we have, a, you know, again, going back to the three years movie, we hang the GPA in a, you know, the rank in, a, in publicly. And we actually have a, this kind of a dignity of, um, uh, of, the, of the profession. Like uh, we always criticize some people for having, you know, we have that kind of mentality. Oh, computer science means the best student, totally wrong. Mm -hmm. so, you know, this metallurgy means lower in the rank. Okay, once upon a point, but metallurgy changed the whole world. The material right. science that actually revolutionized the, all of us, right? So we, we need to ch uh, change our thinking, thought process. Mm -hmm. About the subject matter, I would like to mention one of the tweet, you, they can Google it, uh, that Bill Gates tweet on 2017, I believe. So he made some suggestions for, um, for, uh, for the future students. One is that 
he actually listed three different uh, subject matter that can change the future world. Mm -hmm. Artificial intelligence was one of them, then biomedical science. Mm -hmm. And the third one, I guess, is the energy probably, the renewable energy or something, right? So it doesn't mean that that particular, you know, other subject matter doesn't matter. All subject matter can be redirected to that area. Let's say I'm actually working on the biomechanics, right? Mm -hmm. So if I if 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 I, if there is a in electrical engineering student, they can because we are actually making the product. Let's say if there is a uh, uh, if there is a exoskeleton or robot, it has to be a human engineer design because we are the consumer. We need to use it. If we get accident and if we cannot use it, then there is no ways of uh, there is no need of that product, right? So mm -hmm. they can. So ultimately, it's uh, basically like. Uh, if they need to think about the interdisciplinary way. And second thing that they need to change their thought. Like you are in electrical engineering, you can easily go to the mechanical engineer. Right. You can, you so you can actually apply to even um, out of the engineering. If there is a <laughs> subject that related to the electronics, find right. it out, you know, find your area of interest and do not worry about this back you know those breakdown that we have seen in bangladesh it doesn't right. matter there are mm -hmm. like a hundreds of program we only always think about our seven or eight programs right mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's true so yeah. nothing, nothing so electrical is engineering you will find many faculties their background is in electrical engineering yeah right right yeah we got a couple of other questions but i guess we are going Talk another 15 minutes, then it will be one hour, 15 minutes talk, probably 10 more minutes. What do you think, Tarek? Yeah, yeah. OK, so if you have some time, then we can take yeah, time. I have time till 11.30 here. OK. So another 13 minutes. OK, so um, one of the questions I got here from Galib Anur, his question is, how to search for universities in USA specifically for master's funding? I cannot answer that question. <laughs> talk, to your, talk to your friends, please. I, I'm so sorry. I mean, that is not the, I, I'm not here to tell you like, you know, as a colleague, as your friend helping you, mm -hmm. I'm here to tell you as a faculty, you know, to give you some, um, some advice about what we look at it and what you can make a difference. So this okay. is something you need to ask to your, your friend. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so no problem at all. So Galiban Noor, if you need really help, how to search or any related information, please go to our Facebook group. You can post your questions over there. We have our website. We have hundreds of blogs, videos in our YouTube channel. So go there. I, I believe that you can find your answer. If you can't do that, please write to us, post in our Facebook group. We'll try to answer those questions over there. Okay, so another question from Taki Hassan Rafi is again related to GPA. So probably Dr. Choudhury really need to make right. sure that GPA is not the only thing because we are getting a lot of questions about GPA. And he's saying with a GPA of less than three, should that particular student forget about the dream of USA? No. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's I believe. So what's your thought about that? Again, I have seen my colleagues to hire many students having GPA below three. Right. So, you know, if you have a master's, let me put it another one. If you have a GPA three, go for a master's program in Bangladesh, get a GPA of 3.5. If you have a master's degree, nobody will bother about your, your, your bachelor's because your latest degree, your latest affiliation is very important. Another thing is that the university matters too, especially like, uh, let's say, um, if, if uh, I can I can actually mention a few, few things. If there is a candidate, good candidate, if somebody asks me about that, uh, you know, talk a little bit about this candidate. Since I am from Bangladesh, I can tell about that candidate, whether he is from a good university or not. So same thing happened if I have a colleague from Brazil, uh, Brazil, uh, Brazil if I can see that uh, he has a good GPA, he has a kind of a moderate GRE, I ask my colleague, what do you think about this candidate? 
and he will tell me whether that person is from a good university or not. So, um, so again, it's a total package. So don't worry about GPA. Again, don't <laughs> worry about it. Even if you have a GPA low, just apply it. Mm -hmm. You have to get attention of somebody else. You will somebody will help you if you have a good GRE or or other things. And if you are too worried and if you do not get confidence, go for a master's program, get a 3.5 above, and then apply. Does Thank it help? I, I want to I want to add that no one can take away your dream. No right. one can take away your dream. So if you have a dream to go for higher study in the USA, go for it. You will find a way to go to to go there. If you have a lower GPA, try to do something that can make your resume outstanding. Try to try to work on some projects that can show your intelligence, your talent. Right. No, so as, as Dr. Choudhury mentioned, it's, it's not only GPA, it's a complete package. If you are lower in GPA, try to improve some other aspects of your application package, but do not give up your dream. All right, so one, one really interesting question I got in the comment box that I would like Dr. Choudhury to answer. What are some common red flags in an applications that might lead to rejections? I think that's a really good question. The greatest, I would say this is the greatest question. I mean, <laughs> I mean, uh, that's really a great question. Great question. I mean, I need to think about it because there are so many things. Oh, I don't want to take a whole lot of things. Do not lie. Do not. We'll catch you. Number one, uh, do not lie uh, in your application package and do not exaggerate. Like I have seen many, not many, a few students from Bangladesh, not as a faculty, as a, as a, as a friend, I have seen them that they used to exaggerate themselves a lot. Like uh, in a in, in Bangladesh body, chapabaji kora dorkani. You can actually, you know, translate it in English. So, um, those are the red flag one and second is that grammatical errors uh, is is a red flag that i already mentioned and so and uh, you know these are the two things that come to my mind and as long as you are yourself be yourself and uh, be honest and I, i'm I, I believe in god i feel like that somebody will help you mm -hmm. somewhere you will get you know your dream you know to be uh, concrete so uh, red flags is do not lie and do not blabber and do not exaggerate those are the things it means honesty and second is that grammatical mistakes mm -hmm. so uh, you know share your package with a couple of friends can you please read it can you please help me to review it do that mm -hmm. okay another question is about GRE so there are some universities in US waiving GRE requirement for grad admission. What is the future direction of higher education in US? Okay. Uh, I'm not sure what the question specifically mean by that. It's uh, I feel like that it's a uh, so it's probably he or she wants to mean that what what are, since some of the universities are they are waiving GRE, so he or she is saying is it is it yeah, yeah, I understand that. Okay, I mean, you know, as I mentioned, Tarek, I will. I I know that I will receive this question. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, GRE is an admission criteria for the research universities, right? So that particular criteria has been waived for only next year. So right. this is a special case. It's not for all, forever. Mm -hmm. So you will get admitted, but if you uh, if you want to come to US uh, with that admission without funding, then listen to that criteria. Mm -hmm. But if you um, if you really want to get funding, sit for the GRE exam. So think about it. We received like a 200 applications. Now you if you do not have a GRE. On the other hand, other 50 students have GRE. Why I'm going to spend time with you? Right. Right. So I so go for it. Sit for. I mean. I'm pretty sure that it, uh, this is not official. Do not take it as a as a as an official statement. Mm -hmm. As a 
um, like a, as a friend suggesting you that sit for the GRE exam, get the GRE score, send it to you know uh, the university. I know that there will be a lot of people they will listen to it. That means you haven't listened to it, so you will be far above other candidates. Go for the GRE exam, sit for it, and uh, you know send it to the graduate committee. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Choudhury. So even the GRE exam is waived. It doesn't. It doesn't mean that you don't have to take GRE. So if you take the GRE score, that will increase your probability. That will. Uh, uh, if you do not have a GRE, um, we cannot discriminate you about funding. That's true. But you know, individual. There could be some individual bias. Let's say if I have a five applicants. Four of them did not sit for the GRE. One of them uh, sit for the GRE. Then I'm gonna say oh, that means these four are kind of lazy, probably. They may not, they do not have a good work ethic, so they are not serious about applications. I'm gonna choose the person who has the GRE for funding, not for admission. Right. You'll get admission, but for funding, I'm a skeptic whether you will get funding if you do not have a GRE score. Cool, cool. So I want to mention one thing. Uh, if you are preparing for GRE in HarrisTripRep.com, we have a comprehensive GRE course. It's completely free. Please go there, check out the courses, as well as we have practice and mock test module in HarrisTripRep.com. More than you will get more than 600 plus high standard questions over there. Two mock tests over there, which is the interface is exactly same as the original ETS GRE exam. So you will get the feelings of real exam before sitting for the real exam. So that's that's really helpful, uh, I believe. So go there, check it, check it out, highstudyprep.com. So we're thinking to arrange this kind of live sessions more regularly. So if you think that these sessions will help you, please let us know. Let us know in the comment box. Let us know in our website. Let us know in the Facebook group. If we, if we get good responses from you guys, we'll try to arrange these kind of sessions more regularly in the future. We are getting really uh, out of time. Uh, this time we are almost one and a half hour. So I'm going to... Uh, adjourn the live sessions for today. Thank you so much, Dr. Shuman Choudhury. We are really honored to have you here today. Uh, do you have any anything to say to our students today? Any last? Well, I I have I, I'm not a motivational speaker. <laughs> but I can say that you know, sit for the GRE, mm -hmm. get a good GRE score. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, life is, uh, you know, it's a. You guys are still in a short period of time. It's still a long way to go. Get your dream. And um, and one more thing, I want to say that Tarek, uh, thank you for uh, us, you know requesting me for this uh, session. And uh, I'm really uh, honored to attend this session. And um, yeah, I did it for you and Rupna, and we have a special bonding. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. So thank you guys and uh, have a, uh, I wish the best in your career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Shuman Choudhury. If, if you still have questions, we can't answer all of the questions today. Yeah, we can to Tarek and Tarek can forward it to me. Please, not to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if you have any questions, please uh, write it down in the comment box. If you can't answer it now, Probably we can't answer it now. We will try to answer it in the future. If you will still have questions, go to our Facebook group or to our website and shoot the questions to me. I will try to answer. Yeah. So we'll try to arrange this type of sessions more regularly in the future. Hope uh, we'll see you again in some future sessions. Until then, goodbye. Stay safe. See you again. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Tarek. Thank, thank you, you all guys thank who are participating in this session. Bye. Bye.